Welcome to Our Next Existence by Katie and the Chorus. I'm Katie, former technology strategist turned reluctant spiritual medium, and I channel messages from the Chorus, a group of beings just beyond our sensory perceptions who are loving, expansive, and who greatly enjoy sharing their perspective of us. Join us each week as we share and discuss their ideas about humanity's existence, purpose, and future. Concepts you can draw from to accelerate your path, expand your perceptions, and ultimately step into the flow of the universe and your life. Welcome back, everybody. For those who don't know, I wanted to announce that we have a Facebook discussion group. It's the Katie and the Chorus discussion group. There's a link to it from our website. But we've been having some pretty amazing conversations in there. The questions have been a lot of fun. I mean, often it amounts to things I always went to the chorus with, which is, what the hell is this? <laughs> so if you have any of those kinds of questions or would just be interested in hearing other people's questions, you'd be welcome to join. And before we get into today's episode, I would like to make a request, which is think about something that you are curious about. Maybe it's something that you're curious about right now, or maybe it's something that you have always been curious about. Maybe even just one of those hobby topics or something you like going and looking for in the evenings when you're winding down. And if you can, say it out loud right now. Just say it. I'm so bossy today, I know. But manifestations make things real in our reality. And so I think this episode will resonate in a deeper place by way of your making a manifestation about your own beautiful curiosity at the start of it. Do you want me to say mine? Okay, fine. I just told you guys to do it. And then as I'm like, oh, I guess I should do it too. It's like, fine. (laughs) That, that, all the beliefs that culminate in that experience is what this episode is about today. It's not always easy to just be us, what we are, what we want uniquely. Why is it so difficult sometimes to just move towards the things that we are passionate about, excited about, or even just curious about. I am curious about our ancient history and ancient places all over the world. It's been a lifelong curiosity. I was at one point contemplating being a history major in college. My history professor even told me once that I was really good at it but it didn't seem practical, so I didn't. I once almost had an internship to do underwater archaeology, but it was expensive and I thought I needed to get a different job and save some money, even though I longed to do it. All my elective courses were history topics. Most of the books I read for fun are history topics. And I get the most excited when we're booking a vacation somewhere to look around and see what old stuff we can go visit while we're there. (laughs) Sounds so obvious when I sum it up like that, doesn't it? Sure. But also I've come a long way in honoring these subtle little things that we each desire the slightest suggestion of, oh, doesn't that sound fun, means so much more to me today than it did back then. And maybe by way of today's episode, it will start to feel so much easier to see and to embrace for you too. In the first part of the episode, you'll hear directly from the chorus themselves, and then afterwards we will discuss I look forward to hearing what you're curious about.
We like the human question, how are you? Though it may not translate in every language, we celebrate this interesting reflection of everything that you are. For how is often related to what you do, and doing is what you are being in these belief systems. For you are creating, by way of your resonance here, the matching beliefs that represent the experience of these energies of limitation. And so perhaps from our perspective, another way of asking that question might be to say, are you? No how, no doing, no happening. Just simply a perfect reflection of your existence which is always expanding, is always assured, is always radiant, full of love and life and ever-growing. Therefore, this question might always be answered very simply. Are you? To which any being in all of creation could reply, yes. There is much, beloved ones, that you could say we had taken for granted about our existence, that we had overlooked, or you might even say been unconscious to, about the way that we are, have existed, have created, until we all stumbled upon ones such as yourself, you could say. Your contrast to ours is a powerful force and will continue to be so, particularly as you awaken. The effects that humanity causes as you come to consciousness of what you are should not be underestimated. We know that as you awaken, you are often consumed or preoccupied by the many things going on in your five senses reality, in your days, in your times. The chaos that seems to sometimes reign over your days and what to do about all of these new and unpredictable things. But there is also an effect, a ripple that humanity emanates through all energies in this dimension, perhaps we could say, and your corner of the universe. As humanity continues to awaken, as you begin to bring consciousness to these energies and move through them, there is a real energetic shift that occurs, a change. You could consider this concept like a playground seesaw. Imagine that humanity is at one end of the seesaw and, shall we say, the beings that surround your civilization that are peripheral or adjacent to your daily lives, but are still in touch with what the human civilization does, is at the other end of the seesaw. Let us say that perhaps right now there is a balance between these two ways of being. What do you think will happen as humanity moves away from your end of the seesaw towards the middle of it, towards the apex, towards the fulcrum, the balance point, where you are neither at one end of the seesaw or the other. There is a shift. There is a change that is felt. 
Now, we have used a very linear concept to illustrate our point, but it is not that simple. And also, all the beings on the other end of the seesaw do not necessarily go down. We emphasize this point as we know humanity has quite a lot of judgments about what down represents. Figuratively and literally, humans do not often like to go down. So perhaps another way we can describe this analogy is by way of fluid dynamics. And to say that as you shift in the ripples of energy that surround you, as you move your mass in a different direction, inevitably, others are affected. What does this mean for humanity? Well, perhaps nothing different than what we have been talking about all along. It is awakening. And you will cause others to awaken as well. Just as your contrast to ours has taught us many things, so too will your contrast to others. Others that you may even start to be perceiving on your specific wavelengths of the five senses. Because, dear ones, as you shift from one end of the seesaw towards the middle, so too will your ability to perceive others also shift. What was once not possible to be seen by your eyesight, now will. What was not possible to be heard by your ears, now will. As we have mentioned before, the human belief system is a resonance, a creation. Therefore, as you change your resonance, so too will your beliefs shift, and as such, your embodiment of this resonance will also reflect these changes. There will be many perspectives about the shift of humanity. Some have already determined before it has even begun that it is unwanted. Others believe or hope that it is the culmination of much effort. And finally, there are some who do not even yet understand that this is happening at all. And what about you, dear one? You see, before, in your belief systems, it was easy to average yourself out into the masses. To listen to something like this and say, well, they don't really mean me. But those winds are changing. The energy that you are able to perceive is expanding. And therefore, it is quite possible to rendezvous with a message from beings who are not speaking to a faceless mass, but who are quite intentionally speaking to every individual, whoever, will come across these recordings. You are special. You are unique. There are none in creation, in all of creation, such as you. And the more you step into this light that shines upon all the facets and all the aspects of the being that you are, the more you will see what we see and also much more than even that. As you shift to these new energies and these new places, to the center of the seesaw or in new areas of your fluid, energetic ocean, however you wish to envision it, there will be many beings who will appear and will have much to say to humanity much that they believe, much that they 
are eager to share and perhaps have waited a long time to share. And this will be a revelation and an exciting time. However, what might surprise you all and them all is what humanity has to say. We love you infinitely and we are happy to be with you on the seesaw, the slide, the swing set, or any other experience that you would like to have. called you out. <laughs> they were all like, we see you humans. We know that you're going to be listening to this podcast while you're walking or taking a bath or driving your car. And you're going to think, oh yeah, that's interesting. Doesn't really apply to me exactly. And then they went to extra effort to specify that, oh no, they meant you, each of you. They are aware of you. They can connect to you. Their energy is that vast and that flexible and that fluid and that powerful too. I remember the first time I got called out, it freaked me out. <laughs> it's right around the time I was working in aerospace and all of this had started, but in sort of like a, a vague, not really clear way. Like maybe I knew something was going on with me, but I thought it was mostly just illness. This was just as I was starting to channel directly, like just as. And before that, my interest in esoteric topics sort of accelerated. In all directions. So I mean like Egyptian meditations, like Buddhist philosophies, like anti-gravity. I mean, there's not a domain that I can think of that I didn't start to reach for the fringe of it. So if I was working in science, like I went to physics and then I went to the edge of physics. <laughs> and if I was thinking about like wellness, you know, I went to wellness and meditation and then, you know, that you're energetic body and then the edge of it like what's on the other side of that and then in terms of like I don't know pop culture society I went towards aliens extraterrestrials and what's on the edge of that you know so I mean it was probably obvious to an outside observer that I was looking for something slash on the verge of finding a new something within myself but I didn't quite see it and then an opportunity came up to listen to Bashar. Now, as I mentioned in season one of the podcast, uh, Bashar is channeled by a man named Daryl Anka. And they have been a dynamic duo for several decades now. Bashar claims to be an extraterrestrial who contacted Daryl. Contacted, I guess I can't say that. I think... Daryl became aware of this possibility of alien contact and then kind of aware of Bashar specifically and then sort of opened up to receiving his messages. Now, by Daryl's own account, Daryl sort of is an unconscious channel. That is to say that he sort of steps out of the conscious perspective in his body and Bashar kind of steps in. 
I have heard him describe that he has vague recollections of what Bashar says, but it feels very dreamlike to him, feels as if he's gone into a dreamlike space, while Bashar comes in and expresses these messages. Now, today, as a channel and as having had many of these conversations with the chorus, this makes a lot of sense to me. Because really, our definition of the unconscious or the subconscious or the dream state is sort of our catchphrases for where we go when we exit, the, the resonance with these belief systems, when we sort of shift over into a different frequency. And so I'm not surprised that as Daryl shifts into a more expanded place where he can sort of step out and Bashar can step in, it would feel dreamlike because he's still enough in the human perspective to name it in that way, but it also senses like that because it is probably more fluid or more expansive than our five senses frequencies. So as I was doing a lot of this researching the fringe of every fringe I could possibly find, (laughs) I was at the fringe of the fringe I discovered Bashar and started to listen to many of their channeled messages and discussions. And what I loved about the way that they approach things was its practicality. He really tried to describe things in a way that explained how they worked. So when an opportunity arose for me to see Daryl channel Bashar live in Sedona, Arizona, at first I was hesitant And then I was sort of really interested in it. And then a lot of synchronous things happened that sort of just lined up the whole trip for myself and two friends to all land there in Phoenix at the same time and drive together to this event. As we were driving from Phoenix to Sedona, I remember feeling afraid. I'd never done anything like this. I was a very practical, logical, (laughs) pragmatic, employee of an aerospace company. (laughs) And so it seemed odd. It seemed like I was an imposter in a lot of ways to be going to an event like this. It felt like fringe, which is where I had been spending most of my free time, but fringe in a way that seemed risky or dangerous. Like if I believed in this stuff too much, I don't know, it would carry me away (laughs) into fringe land. (laughs) As usual, the fear that we feel as we reach the edge of our belief systems, which is our perception of fear, that friction that we feel as we reach the edge of our belief systems is what we call fear. That is all very rational. It has lots of beliefs to draw upon as to why this is something we should be afraid of. So looking back, a lot of my beliefs now don't feel as rational, but that's because my beliefs have expanded. My fence line is further out. I allow in way more perspectives, way more easily than I could have back then. So now those reasons are not enough to justify a fence line. Now I look back and I say, well... I don't think I really needed to be that afraid that my coworkers would find out I was listening to an alien channel all weekend. (laughs) But back then, that seemed like a valid concern. So we arrive at the event, and there's two days of channeling, essentially, maybe like a day and a half. And the first day is great, and I loved the topics, and I was so glad to be there. I liked having that kind of discussion. I like hearing those sorts of things. I really enjoyed the questions from the audience. It was a very pleasant day and and really not one that caused any fear, I would say, within the session. Maybe a little flutter of uncertainty or when they would allude to things that I didn't understand. I I felt the bottomlessness of that unknown occasionally. But then on the second day... (laughs) They were sort of wrapping up the event and Bashar and I guess the people that he represents, the beings that he represents, were sort of like thanking everyone for attending and, and, you know, in their final message and really talking about how excited they were for where humanity is going. 
And then I can't remember exactly how. But Bashar, through Daryl, says something to the effect of, and we were really glad, or we are really glad, to meet all of you. And, you know, everyone's listening and everyone's sort of like, "Uh uh-huh. And then almost in the same way as the chorus did today, Bashar seemed to sense that maybe his point had been lost. And he said, again, I can't remember exactly how, but he said, he said it again, almost to the effect of like, no, we are really glad to meet you. As in you all sitting in this room right now. And the second time he said it with that emphasis, we are glad to meet you, like pointing right there at us. (laughs) You could tell that it sunk in in a deeper way for every single person sitting in those chairs. I felt it. I felt it for me. I felt it for the whole room. And do you know what it was? It was that shit just got real. Isn't that interesting? You could say it was about being singled out. You could say it was about the light was then cast off the stage where Bashar had been and onto all of us for the first time. But really, another way of looking at what happened was that as we drop down out of our perspective as a group, as we relax the idea that we're just averaged into this humanity thing, we step further into the present moment where things become real. That moment catapulted me into the chaos that ensued for the next several weeks. I can't say that it was causal. I can't say that going and seeing Bashar, I mean, just unlocked everything within me. I think these things all coincide because we're the ones who are expanding. So it would be easy to say like, oh, the chorus came here with this message to awaken us. Not by their account. What they're saying is you found your way to these podcasts and to us. And similarly, I found my way to Bashar and I also found my way into three following weeks of chaos where my son's childcare had some awful stuff happen. My health plummeted. I started having body spasms and nervous system issues, a real bout of them, vertigo, burning sensations on the top of my head. And see, I know even as I say that last one, that last one means something different to us, doesn't it? In spiritual awakening, burning sensations at the top of the head are often forgiven or even desired because they represent some sort of spiritual awakening. And so isn't that, isn't that interesting? You might have felt sympathy for me as I described vertigo or body spasms or my son's childcare. But when I got to one that our beliefs have already changed about, I know that some of us would feel, oh, wow. As in like something must have been happening to her that ultimately led to greater things. And that can be said about everything that we are going through right now. So needless to say, as I'm going through these three, you know, succeeding weeks of chaos, total chaos and bodily pain, I kept coming back to this idea that, I mean, frankly, the aliens had said they knew who I was. (laughs) I mean, by this point, I had listened to Bashar enough that I pretty much believed, like, this isn't Daryl's subconscious. This really feels like a separate entity. And this separate entity claims to be an extraterrestrial. By our definition, I will point out most specifically, they might define themselves in many other ways. But by way of how our society is operating or views 
the universe at the moment, we have an idea of extraterrestrials. And so when this dude at the end of the session is like, we're so glad to meet you, like you, (laughs) it really stuck with me. And I found myself plunged into many, many days, weeks of coming back around to contemplating this idea. I'd get distracted by what was going on and the chaos or whatever. I'd pick my head up again. And there this concept would be waiting for me. Like, ah, today was rough. Where are we? I don't know. What's going on? And then like, bam, front and center. An alien knows I exist. (laughs) What do I even do about that? I was so unnerved. I was so unnerved because it was real. It, it went from being fringe topics that some people out there really believe in to me being just, just dabbling in it, just curious, just wondering what I could extrapolate from that place and apply to my life. And instead, I kind of got pulled out of the herd and stuck under a flashlight. Some of you may have felt some of these sensations as you heard the chorus talk today. They're very, very loving. They are very, very embracing. So I would hope that it wasn't totally fear, because even if you've reached the edge of your belief system, there is still a part of us that can recognize an expansive and loving frequency and at times that can soften our resistance to our own edge of beliefs. As we know, love is our perception of allowing. Therefore, when we love something, we allow it to pass through us, we allow it to be, and so we transcend through it. And so often by loving your own fears or limitations, you eventually find the ways that you work with them or around them or move beyond them or come back to them later. And that acute, uncomfortable sensation of fear can soften. Needless to say, whether it was an acute fear or a very soft and loving chorus fear, (laughs) I would not be surprised if you felt it because they are pointing again the light at you and who you are individually and uniquely. Our idea of uniqueness is usually a version of five senses limitation. The ways in which we can be unique are often based in sort of these beliefs. It's not like we can fundamentally change shape or mold time or bend realities. Instead, it's that we dress a little differently speak or sing a little differently or do things that are considered maybe different from the way others would do them. But we're still here, visible in body, behaving in some ways as a human. This belief, or actually it's an entire colossal construct of beliefs, disallows our ability to see much of the unique beings that we are behind this facade, the facade of the game avatar, basically, the way we express ourselves in these wavelengths. We are much more than this, as we know. But it's often not until someone very expressly points out our uniqueness that we have this experience of realizing how much we were just hiding in the crowd. We may not have even been realizing we were until something pulls you forward and you realize that you had been at arm's length. Said another way, that is often how we hold at arm's length manifestations. There is a very big difference between thinking about something and actually doing it. Though we have noticed interesting connections between visualizing, let's say doing something and then actually performing it, 
In no way have we ever found that thinking about something is a substitute. (laughs) Hard as we might visualize how that basketball game will go, our performance in that basketball game does not actually happen until we play it. (laughs) At least for now, I guess. You can dream about how the job interview will go, but ultimately, you have to apply. You can talk a lot about all the expeditions you've always wanted to take, But ultimately, you have to get on the plane, put on your boots, and get very muddy as you climb to the top. We know this. Many of us know this, in fact, quite painfully. We've wondered why we have wanted something for so long, and yet why is it so hard to just book the damn flight? That is because this aspect of standing at the fringe of actually averaging ourselves into the herd is vital to our inability to perceive the uniqueness of what we each are and bring because that was our objective. We came here to be average. (laughs) We came here to not really know anything about ourselves, to be disconnected from everything that is special or extraordinary in our beings and to have the experience of rediscovering those things and reconnecting to them. Or, said another way, discovering and expanding into them for the very first time. It is that difficult to book that plane flight or to finally apply for that job. In some cases, and it is not difficult to take action in other areas, in other cases, because some of these actions connect to deeply held desires that are a reflection of this uniqueness of what we are And if you step into the spotlight by acting upon them, you may catch a glimpse of what you are. There are many, many beliefs that keep us at the edge of the limelight, of the spotlight, of situations where our dreams would become more real. So, truly, It's not your fault. It's nobody's fault. Well, except it's totally and completely ours. (laughs) Because we built these beliefs of limitation for this experience. And now we're starting to see them. And now we're starting to have experiences of recognizing that there are some situations that are just brutal to step into and yet somehow are deeply longed for. This is why in many visualization and expansive spiritual circles, they will suggest take whatever small step you can in making that experience more real. So let's say you want a multi-million dollar mansion. Well, maybe rent one for a night and spend one night in it and make it real. These are small forays into the limelight. These are small forays into the direction of what might show you a glimpse of what you're capable of. Isn't it funny? I thought I was moving towards the fringe when I started to open up to all these unknown or outlier topics. When in actuality, my attraction to these things despite their not making sense, despite their potentially posing a risk and instigating a lot of fear, was actually my stepping away from the beliefs that kept me at the fringe of my own light. Friends, this is true for our collective group consensus. We have a lot of judgments about the people and the topics that we consider to be fringe. 
It's a little too out there. It's a little too weird. (laughs) Beings or aliens or crystals or energetic healing. It's just too different often for us to feel comfortable contemplating at first. But I'd like to make a suggestion. Those people are not at the fringe. We are. Those people have somehow finally found their way into the spotlight of their unique being and in those places have begun to have extraordinary experiences. As we have said many times before, the more we are able to accept who we are, the more we allow of this experience, the more we transcend it, and the more we are likely to encounter more and different perspectives by way of the ability we have developed to be at peace with more of our perspectives. It is allowance for allowance, the universe responds. And perhaps it is that many of us who are still tightly abiding by these beliefs, who are at the edge. We are locked in or perhaps prevented from stepping into those directions that would allow us to experience, to truly embody, to live our uniqueness. What if those outlier communities and strange topics are actually where we get to finally book the tickets? or play the basketball game, or begin to live our dreams. That's not to say that someone's outlier topic has to be yours. The point is that those outlier topics started to be created by the people who started to move in those directions of their own light. We are yet to see what will be created when you feel a freedom to move in this direction too. There are topics that will exist that we don't yet have names for today. There are ways that we will begin to meet more and different beings that have not happened yet because we're waiting for you. I'll be honest. After I had gotten through those three chaotic weeks, I stopped listening to Bashar. I was scared. I didn't know what was happening. And I felt like I had crossed a line I didn't intend to. Namely, that my life would not be the same. And I didn't know what that meant. In my mind, I had just gone to an alien channeling thing in Sedona on a girl's trip for fun. And then somehow, things went much farther than I could have imagined. I felt a real sense of contact. I felt like it had already happened. And I wasn't sure that I was ready for it. So I avoided it. But I thought about it. And as I opened up to and started channeling the chorus, I evaluated whether or not they felt like those weird ETs, (laughs) which I was at that time sworn off of. And they didn't. In fact, it was so clear to me that they felt different because of the most poignant experience I had just walked through. This gave me, somehow, a greater curiosity. I didn't know who I was talking to, but they felt loving and they felt expansive, and I was interested to find out more. That was the beginning. Curiosity is one of the many ways that we lead ourselves into our own light. What may seem like an innocent force at face value is actually a powerful expression that combines 
in certain flavors, love, and allowance. When we are curious, we are actually more powerful and invincible than we yet understand. Curiosity is an open interest and, in some ways, a trust. We forget to think about how much time is passing when we're deeply interested in learning a topic. We don't worry about what the impact will be or what will happen next. We're present in what it is that we are openly receiving. You might say that I should have somehow settled that score with my fear about being singled out by the extraterrestrials. Maybe. That would have been a path. But it was curiosity that led me to that weekend in Sedona. And it was curiosity that led me away from that experience and towards the chorus. As the chorus suggested a few weeks ago, we are entering a phase where there may be loose ends multiplying. (laughs) There may be a growing abundance of things that we don't understand for a minute or two, and that is because all topics are opening. All topics are expanding. We are not closing doors, dusting off our hands and wrapping things up. (laughs) We are finding that our very existence has more to it than we thought. One way to navigate these waters, subtle in its simplicity, is by way of the compass of curiosity. You won't need all the answers in every moment. You need just the answer of that present moment, of this one. And how will you find the answer that you're looking for? Curiosity will direct you in the most abundantly expansive and satisfying direction that you will most benefit from next. I was not curious any longer about Bashar after that weekend and, honestly, have not really been since. But now, several years later, I find that I'm starting to be. Was I missing something about him them and that understanding between then and now? I don't think so. (laughs) My plate felt pretty full with chorus and everything else. When I am not curious about something, I let myself be. And when I am curious about something, I move in that direction. As these mysteries bubble up, you may find that everyone you know turns in the direction of a particular unknown. And if you find that your curiosity tugs your shirt sleeve in a different direction, that's the direction away from the fringe and into your unique light. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you found these messages to be helpful. May they accelerate you on your path wherever you'd like it to go. For more information on The Chorus and I, our podcast, book, or how to get in touch with us, visit katieinthechorus.com. Thanks again. See you next time.